it's always so weird doing these lectures when you can't actually, I can see a list of people that know faces, but it's very lovely to have all of you here and a great pleasure indeed to introduce um, to introduce Nicholas Bombay and to say how pleased we are to have him from Simon Fraser University. Um, he's the author of lots of books about law, space, the geographies of power, unsettling the city, urban land, politics of property, rights of passage, uh, the uh, red zones, the use of ball and sentencing conditions in the management of marginalized populations and so forth. So lots of work on um, property and, and rights. And he's also um, received a number of um, awards and fellowships. So for example, in 2017, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. In 2019, he received a, a, an award of excellence from the Association of Law, Property and Society. He's been a distinguished visiting fellow at the University of Cambridge in 2014 and a visiting fellow at the University of Kent Law School in 2019. Uh, in 2012, his book on rights of passage received the Harp Socio-Legal Studies Association Book Award and uh, he's got very strong community engagement in his work. A lot of it's concerned uh, with collaborating, uh, for example, in community-based community research with house homeless people. Uh, he's a co-investor in a participatory action research project involving low-income uh, hotel residents in Vancouver. He's also mobilized his research uh, in judicial cases, for example, as an expert witness in a British Columbian Supreme Court case relating to the regulation of homeless people. And he does legal advocacy relating to Canadian uh, or bail and protection law, probation law. Now, while he's actually at the IS, virtually, sadly, he will contribute to Professor Chris Gerard and Dr. Henry Jones's major um, IS research project, Negotiating the Landscapes of Rights. And this will have a particular focus on the dimensions of commoning. And he's also hoping to engage with scholars interested in the geographies of law and aims to work on a book manuscript on the critical geographies of property. So a very warm welcome to you, to you, Nick. And I think we're gonna sort of hand over to your recording first of all. Thank you. Good afternoon, or in my case, good morning. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I come to you today from the unceded Indigenous territories of the Kwantlen and Keitsi First Nations, on whose lands I hold a property title by virtue of the ongoing work of settler colonialism. I'd like also to thank uh, Durham University and the IAS for inviting me to, uh, to visit as a fellow this term, um, and I've greatly enjoyed my fellowship so far. Um, I'm going to share with you my uh, screen. So um, I'd like to speak today about what I'm calling living in the hum, and I'll explain what that means in just one minute. But, but by way of context, I should note that I am um, affiliated with the IAS project called Negotiating Landscapes of Rights. And I take from this project a focus on practice and the performance of property, particularly commonly held property, and an engagement with multidisciplinary scholarship, including geography and law. And that's really where I, um, my work is focused. Now, in a, my IAS seminar in January, I explored some questions around the relationship between territoriality and property in grappling with the spatiality, relationality and power dynamics associated with the access and use of land, however held. So what I'd like to try and do today is to, to talk about an ongoing research project and bring those two threads together, the questions of territoriality and the negotiation of the landscape of rights. Um, and I'd like to try and bring these threads together to to make sense for the first time of some research data. Um, I'm affiliated with a, a, a funded research project. It's in its second year now. Um, and I collaborate with students and academics at my own university, Simon Fraser University, uh, but also lawyers at the Allen School of Law at uh, the University of British Columbia and the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa, as well as the 
uh, much welcome participation of community members themselves. We've been engaged in what we colloquially call the Stuff Project. Um, our focus is, and I'll focus on this today, is on conducting interviews and focus groups with precariously housed people, people living outside or in shelters uh, or living in precarious uh, housing conditions of various sorts, but the, in particular concerning the challenges they face, and they are profound in securing and controlling their possessions, their personal possessions, their stuff, including practical items like bikes and tents, but also animals, um, IDs, uh, items of memory, and so on. Before COVID hit, we conducted two focus groups and around 16 individual interviews, and I'm going to be drawing from that initial data set, um, which we're going to build out um, uh, when we're able to, hopefully this year. Now, while the people we speak to here are not commoners, to go back to the IAS landscape of negotiating landscapes of right project. Um, they nevertheless negotiate a landscape of, of rights. And in particular, I would argue of duties, of bans, exclusions, and conditional permissions, often centered on property law that regulate, control, and in many cases, destroy their own possessions. Now we tend not to pay attention to the stories of the people will be talking about today. But that's a mistake. It's a mistake, not only ethically, but also analytically, because they can teach us, I'm going to suggest, some very valuable and important lessons about property and the work that property does in the world. But let me begin with a hum. We asked people in these interviews and focus groups to give us stories about their stuff and the challenges they face in securing their possessions. In many cases, people respond by saying, it's impossible for me to give you one story because there are so many stories. There are so many cases and experiences of loss, of seizure, of theft, um, uh, uh, of their personal possessions. Somebody will call Caroline, one of our respondents, characterized these constant stories as generating what she called a whine or a hum. It's the same story, the hum, over and over again by different people, but it's the same story. Oh my God, they took my stuff. Oh my God, they stole my stuff. Can you believe it? They took my stuff. Our project hopes to uncover stories like Caroline's, including the work of those who regulate other people's stuff for better and more often for worse. Now there are many dimensions to this project, including documenting what is clearly the massively destabilizing effects of losing one's personal possessions, tracing the regulatory logics at work and advocating for policy and law reform in this woefully understudied topic. For now, however, I want to focus on, on the hum and think about the hum. And as I noted, there's very little scholarship on this question. There's scholarship, of course, on homelessness and on poverty, but the, the stuff, the dimension that we're focused in, the, the, the way in which stuff is seized and stolen and, and taken and destroyed is rarely described, particularly in a more systematic way. So let's just reflect on that. Um, but perhaps before we do that, um, we might reflect on the ways in which this already begins to sound like a really very familiar story of poor people, of poverty, of deprivation, and what we might call loss, of losing things. But I would want us to try and reframe the narrative a little bit by drawing from the um, advice, the wisdom, the stories that precariously housed people have given us, uh, and bring a couple of conceptual tools to the conversation. The first is property. I want to bring property squarely into the conversation. Prevailing conceptions of property, however, don't really help us here. Property theory, as property theory is largely predicated on the experience of those with secure title. Property theory isn't designed for people like Caroline. We need to step outside the space of conventional property theory 
and learn, I want to suggest, from the res our respondents. And when we do so, we begin to recognize that this isn't a story of people who are somehow outside property, as poor people and precariously housed people and houseless people are often characterized. I want us to suggest that this is very much a story that's deeply inside property. The experiences, the challenges that the precariously housed face are largely because of the way in which they're embedded in a set of property arrangements. It's not a story, in other words, of no property, but one of what I'm going to call precarious property. Property, moreover, entails not only people's relationship to land, which is the way in which property is usually thought about in scholarship, but also to their personal possessions, their stuff, and adding stuff, personal property, to the equations, to the equation, changes the conversation in really interesting and important ways. Now, secondly, in thinking about property, I want us to avoid the temptation to think of property simply as a relation between people and things, me and my stuff. Rather, it's a set of state-sanctioned relations between people, governing the use and benefit of some valued resource like, like land. Now, these relations, I'm going to suggest, are indelibly power relations, for better or very often for worse. They structure forms of privilege, of dominion, of dependency. Now, these relations can facilitate access and inclusion, but they can also and here we can learn again from our respondents, they can also be very much stories of exclusion and of seizure and denial. Because the endemic experience of the hum, as Caroline reminds us, is one of, of seizure, of people taking other people's stuff away. This is moreover tied to very routinized forms of, of devaluation, devaluation of the person, and of their stuff and the relationship between the two. A denial, in other words, of the, the propertied personhood of uh, people. So this is about relations, about power relations and social relations. And in that sense, this isn't a story of loss, but of taking, of seizure. It's not a story of poverty, but one of impoverishment, of the production of a set of social relations. Property relations, property law rather, holds up certain relations, particularly the simple title, while devaluing others, such as those of precariously housed people and their possessions. Such modes of valuation and devaluation are moreover entangled with forms of social valuation linked to conceptions of race, of class and of gender. The third point I want us to think about takes us back to territory or territoriality. Territoriality, simply put, is the use, the social use of the territory. A territory is a bounded social space over which spatial access is regulated. Territoriality, in that sense, is a, is a means to power, communicating and enforcing a set of social relations. Precariously housed people, by virtue of the spaces in which they find themselves and the lack of access and control they have over those spaces, are forced to negotiate a territoriality of rights and duties over which they have very limited control. The challenge then is that they are entangled in territorialized relations controlled by others who exercise powers, as I'll show, in often highly unpredictable and capricious ways. So territory and territoriality, but let's just pause on territory and territoriality and come back to property theory a little bit. Because the territorialization of property does important conceptual work, ideological work. Most immediately, I think it might help us, it might help sustain a particular model a hegemonic or dominant model of what property is and what property is not. We can call it the ownership model or the Blackstonian model. The effect of this model and the hegemony of this model makes our project so much harder to do because when property in Western liberal capitalist societies is imagined, it's often through a sort of spatial imaginary or a territorial imaginary. In North America, the metaphor is that of the, the white picket fence. In the British context, perhaps the metaphor is that of the castle. The house of everyone is as to 
is to him as his castle and fortress as well for defense against injury and violence as for his repose, as Edward Cook put it in Semaine's case, Englishman's home is his castle, as it's sometimes summarized. Property is private. Property is sharply bounded. Property is white. Property is heteronormative. Property is middle class. Property lives inside the white picket fence. Now this conception, this, I would argue, deeply flawed conception, but deeply powerful conception, shapes property theory, which privileges private property um, and imagines private property as this bounded exclusionary space. Property draws a circle around the activities of each private individual, as Reich puts it. Within that circle, the owner has a greater degree of freedom than without. Inside the picket fence, there you find property. Outside is no property or threats to property. The people that we're interested in, people living in shelters, living outside, couch surfing, living in awful dodgy private rental spaces are thus imagined as external to property or in a space of no property as one scholar has described homeless people. I want us to step outside the white picket fence and not just step outside, but reflect on the work that that fence does. If we step outside the white picket fence imaginary, I think we maybe get to a more productive space. Given that all land is governed by property rules, we are all by virtue of our embodied spatiality inside property all the time, although under radically different terms. There is no outside or inside to property, only graduated positions of conditional access. Access is negotiated relationally with others, landlords, banks, municipalities, who are relatively situated by property law, granted particular powers or privileges or duties. Everyone's use or benefit of land and the affordances it provides depends on those relationships, legal relationships with others. Such relationships can be mutually beneficial. They can also be extractive and dispossessive. Now, some relations are relatively horizontal. As a white male, fee simple property owning property owner who's paid off his mortgage, I'm in a pretty good space. It's conceivable that I will lose access to my home, but very unlikely. As such, my stuff is secure. Caroline's experience is very different, however. She describes the way in which she moved from one shared private rental space to another with her abusive partner. And those spaces were very, very um, uh, unsettled. We would just go from place, like go get a place. Oh my God, I lost my stuff over and over as she moved through those places. Oh my God, so many times, just moving from place to place and not having anywhere to put it, our stuff, her stuff. She lost her stuff due to theft from other residents. She also lost her stuff from predatory landlords. In one case, she described the way in which a landlord summarily evicted her, like you're out, and stole everything of value of hers and threw the rest outside. Houseless people, setting up a tent on privately owned or city land, access spaces of shelter, like Caroline, through relations to dominant others who can and do summarily withdraw that privilege. In that sense, they live in a world of precarious property relations. Now, property here, as I've described it so far, has been framed largely in relationship to land or, or real property, but property also concerns personal property or chattels, which isn't something that talk, gets talked about very often. Now, while our stuff matters to us all, the challenges and territoriality associated with stuff is of, I would argue, more profound significance to precarious people. And here, a, com a comment made by somebody we'll call Bella in a place called Surrey, which is suburban Vancouver, I think was interesting. She noted the way in which she had been housed throughout her life and then had suddenly become houseless. And she wondered, quote, why are people flipping out about who's sitting in their favorite spot? But as she put it, all you have when you're homeless is the stuff 
you have, all you have when you're homeless is the stuff you have. And I think this is a really important point. Precariously housed people's relationship to land by definition is largely negative. They're forced to negotiate the demands of others, of owners of land. Lacking secure tenure to land, the only property assets you have, although tentatively, as we'll see, is the stuff you have. So what then does it mean to live in the hum, to control or negotiate um, uh, one's relationship to one's stuff under these conditions? Well, conventional property theory is useful here, but in a sort of backwards way. Um, because of the dominance of the white picket fence sort of logic of property in which private property is the norm, uh, the so-called property self remains the norm, the have not other, the exception. This is a quote from Andre van der Valt, uh, the South African property scholar who very sadly passed away a few years ago. So how does the property itself think? What, what is the property itself? What are, what, what, what are the norms or understandings that might um, shape selfhood in that way? Jeremy Bentham wrote famously on property as providing a basis for expectation, an expectation of deriving certain advantages from our property. As he puts it, the idea of property, the idea of property consists in an established expectation, in the persuasion of being able to draw such or such an advantage from the thing possessed according to the nature of the case. What's the established expectation outside the white picket fence? If there is an established expectation, it's one of interminable loss or seizure. Here, this is me interviewing somebody in a city called Abbotsford, which is a small town outside Vancouver. You know it's gonna happen again, you're gonna lose your stuff. Either way, says this person, I can close my eyes or I could be sleeping and something's missing. Here's a person in Toronto. I lost this, I lost that. It's just constant for me. I've lost over the years, I've literally lost everything. Yeah, but what can you do, different person? I mean, I've lost everything at one time, but everything. You lost everything at some point, from pets to kindergarten diplomas, school trophies of kids and stuff like that. People are losing their stuff in many, many ways. They're losing their stuff because they uh, go to prison and when they return, uh, their stuff is gone. Uh, they're losing their stuff because they're outside and the city is seizing their stuff or private owners are seizing their stuff and destroying their stuff. Um, they're losing their stuff because landlords uh, are seizing their stuff, taking what they can from it or destroying their possessions. The stories, as we noted, are many and varied in the hum. So this raises the question of what sort of selfhood does this produce, right? If, if the property itself is predicated on an established expectation of certainty, what is the established expectation of someone who's expecting to lose everything all the time. Jennifer, Jennifer Nadelsky, um, in a wonderful essay, characterized the, the so-called bounded self attached to dominant conceptions of property predicated on the maintenance of sort of hermetic boundaries. But the experience of the precariously housed of the people we spoke to is that of a form of, of unbounded selfhood, predicated on expectations of seizure of loss, loss of material, central to personal safety, central to biography, central to a sense of who one thinks one is, constituting maybe a dispossessive form of subjectivity, subjectivity enacted through all sorts of interesting practices that I can talk about later on. Now stuff, stuff matters to all of us, right? Even inside the fence, my stuff matters to me, my books matter to me. Bentham also talked about his stuff and the importance of his stuff to him. Every part of my property has, he said, beside its intrinsic value, a value of, an, of affection as an inheritance from my ancestors, as the reward of my own labor, or as the future dependence of my children. Thus, our property becomes a part of our being and cannot be torn from us without rending us to the quick. Now, the, the pain of losing, to borrow from Bentham, was also evident for our respondents, but I would argue was intensified. Because again, if all you have when you're poor is the stuff that you have, to, to go back to our, our earlier comment, 
its seizure or destruction is, is intensified. So here's a quote from somebody we call Wendy in Surrey, and she's describing a very common experience, which is um, having one's identification materials lost or stolen or seized or destroyed. Losing your ID, she says, well, it's very difficult and hard to get it. You know, it takes a while to get back. And personally, myself, I didn't feel like I mattered when she lost her star, her ID, because I couldn't prove who I was. I didn't have my birth certificate or anything like that to say, yes, that's who I am. So you just, you feel like you're nothing. I want to be a person. I want to be a somebody that you can recognize. And without the ID, I personally didn't feel like I mattered. But the hum, the experience of the hum and the work of the hum is territorialized, as I tried to indicate earlier on. And one way in which this is experienced by respondents in one city, a place called Abbotsford, is what they describe as the Abbotsford Shuffle. And the Abbotsford Shuffle is not a dance, uh, it's rather um, one predicated on a constant movement. People often camp along land next to a rail line. Here, ownership is divided into long strips owned by the city, by the railway, and by BC Hydro, which is the state-owned energy company. Camped on one parcel of land, respondents noted how they and their possessions are endlessly being shuffled between parcels, sometimes daily. In other words, get off this piece, we don't care where you go. So you go to the next parcel and then you're moved again. They just tell you to move and grab your belongings and go, as one noted. Another noted the cumulative effect. Where can you go? Well, you can't be on this side of the property, 50 feet from here, 20 feet from there. So you're telling me you can't go anywhere. Yeah, pretty much. How do we understand the work of territory in regards to property. So inside the white picket fence, boundaries are supposed to serve really quite simple, functional, efficient, even benign ends. The boundaries of property, or I would describe it the territoriality of property, is famously described by these two gentlemen, Merrill and Smith, American lawyers, who argue for the value of property boundaries in communicating messages to people, ensuring they would argue ultimately property's transactional efficiency. They characterize the property boundary as sending simple messages to outsiders, messages to, to keep out. This is said to permit, as Smith on the right here, owner, this is said to permit owners the space, literally in the case of land, to pursue projects without having to answer to others, thus generally a promoting efficiency and liberty. Now boundaries are clearly evident in the Abbotsford Shuffle and they're clearly sending messages, but they're far from simple, nor do they promote their liberty as owners of their stuff. Moreover, I'm gonna suggest, territory does much more work than Merrill and Smith seem to suggest. The Shuffle alerts us to the ways in which the hum is a mobile one, as people are constantly forced to move in order to retain their possessions. But the territory of property is not static, but temporally dynamic. In other words, it can be turned off or on at any moment, at the discretion of others. Here's Bella in Surrey, and she's she and the next respondent are people who were living in a homeless encampment on um, municipally owned land. Um, you have two days to get out of here. This is the city now comes to them. Now you have another week now. And it's like, when are you coming? I used to tell them, I used to tell the regulators, please tell me the day before if you know you're coming in here and wrecking everything. Bylaws would show up and give you a 24 hour notice, as Brian put it, sometimes not even that. You have to go right now, get your stuff, get as much as you can right now. The truck is coming in 30 minutes and everything else is going in the garbage. And sometimes the truck didn't show up at all. Sometimes the truck, which is the truck, which is going to, people's stuff is gonna be deposited, 
thrown into. Uh, sometimes the truck was there in three minutes instead of 30. Precariously housed people like Bella and Brian live in what Oren Yiftakel would describe as a state of displaceability. Displaceability, as he described it, is the susceptibility of people, and I would argue their stuff, to be removed, to be expelled or prevented from exercising their right to the city. So as he put it, the idea is to think about displacement, moving away from displacement as a static act or a singular act to a systemic condition, a systemic condition. And clearly we see in the hum, this systemic condition of, of the hum at work in which people are constantly being moved and moved in unpredictable ways. And Yiftakel notes that the threat of displacement, and I would argue property seizure, can become a very potent tool. Territoriality is clearly being enforced, as you can see here, in unpredictable and seemingly capricious ways, being turned off or on at the whim of regulators. To be static in the hum is to be vulnerable to the turning off or, on, or turning on of territorial controls. As Bella put it in Surrey, they told everybody, as long as you're mobile, we're not going to touch you. If you can get up at a moment's notice, that's fine. So as long as you're mobile, you're okay. But of course, stuff means that people cannot get up at a moment's notice. Stuff ties people to places. It makes them less mobile and thus more vulnerable to the hum. We are going to touch you. To be static is therefore to have stuff taken from you. Stuff which in many cases is a vital resource, thus becomes a marker, it becomes a risk. But territory is more than simple messaging. The word territory literally derives both from the Latin terra meaning earth and terere which means to frighten. So territory literally put is a land of fear upon which acts of intimidation can be realized. Now inside the white the polite society sustained by the white picket fence, such violences are rarely mentioned, although they're fundamental to the, the production of the white picket fence itself, dominant property relations. Conversely, the precariously housed know only too well the territorial violences, the relational territorial violences of property. Well, legal violence is visited upon bodies do occur, it's the possessions that are more or less fair game and are taken and sometimes destroyed in almost theatrical expressions of violence. This is a quote from Brian again in, in Surrey. And so he's living in this encampment, the truck comes and people's possessions are being thrown into the back of this truck. But this truck is no longer no simple truck. It's also one with a hydraulic press on it, a crusher, as the respondents described it, to pack down the material. My buddy Ben, they threw his tent, all of his stuff, everything he owned into the back of their truck because, well, he isn't staying in this tent. He doesn't need this tent. It's not his. It's garbage. It's nobody's. There were times where they're standing there and they're laughing the city staff, and they're making fun and they're making jokes about how devastated somebody looks and they're throwing stuff in the back of the truck that's going to use a hydraulic press to destroy it. And they're sitting there laughing about it, joking about it. Bella, who you remember, talked about her ID, used, I think not surprisingly, the crusher as a metaphor to describe the manner in which property seizure destroyed not just stuff, but selfhood as well. You've got your ID finally back and it's like, yes, I'm somebody again. I'm a member of society again. And then they take it and you're crushed again because you feel like you're nothing again. And that's what happens to a lot of people when bylaw come and take our stuff is that it crushes you. It just totally, it deflates you and you just want to give up. And they spoke powerfully, our respondents, of the ways in which um, 
they perceived regulators like bylaw officials, city officials, as devaluing their stuff, but also them as well. The connection between the two was profound. Their stuff was garbage, and by extension, so were their owners. So to begin to conclude, how do the precariously housed live in the hum? Well, contrary to dominant conceptions that rest on the security of the white picket fence, life in the hum is predicated on expectations of insecurity of loss. It's very much about the pain of loss. This loss is worked out territorially th through spaces over which people have very limited control. Those spaces are turned off or on in capricious, uh, un unpredictable uh, ways. The experience is moreover one of violence, literal violence, symbolic violence, violence also tied to forms of devaluation. So to conclude, why might any of this be useful? What can we learn? And I argue we should be learning from uh, the experiences of the precariously housed in regard to their possessions, an area, as I said, in which people have done very little work. Although if you talk to precariously housed people, they'll tell you how endemic this and how challenging this experience is. I wanna make three quick points. The first point is, that I don't think we can understand the work of property if we just stay inside the picket fence, the picket fence in which property theory tends to live. We need to confront precarious property, property relations, which are evident inside the picket fence as the mortgage crisis of 2008 revealed, but, but they're much more tangible um, for ideological and practical reasons, if you like, outside the picket fence. The second point is that we need, in thinking about property, we need to think about property in relational terms. Property is about relations between people and a relational lens is analytically helpful, but it's also, I think, ethically helpful. It perhaps allows us to step away from what we might call a damage-centered analysis to borrow from the indigenous scholar Eve Tuck. She lamented the way in which uh, so much scholarship centers on the damage that marginalized people experience. That damage is real, but I think a relational analysis shifts the conversation slightly. As I've suggested, this isn't a story simply of loss, but one of taking, of seizure, of people, other people differently placed taking other people's stuff away. In that sense, it's not a story of pof poverty in a static or inert sense, but one of impoverishment, of the production of poverty. It's not a story of no property, but one of precarious property relations. And my third and final point is that if we step outside the picket fence, and in so doing, reflect back on the picket fence, I think we can begin to see the work that territoriality does in enacting, but also masking property's power in the world. Jennifer Nadelsky, I mentioned her before in a wonderful essay uh, on property and boundaries, noted the way in which boundary metaphors, as she puts it, mask power. The boundaries the law defines and enforces are a means of wielding power, she says, of shielding power and of shielding from power. The boundary metaphor, what I would call the white picket fence, permits us to indulge in focusing on the experience we have in, on and with our property inside the white picket fence and ignore the relationships shaped by the power to exclude. Our focus on boundary turns our attention away from relationship and thus away from the true sources and consequences of the patterns of power that property constitutes. And I will pause there. And thank you very much for your attention. I look forward very much to your uh, comments and questions. Firstly, thank you for an absolutely fabulous lecture, Nicholas. That was really wonderful. I, I'm so enthralled by it. Um, and I'm sure that we will get lots of, of questions and so forth, and I'll put the chat on as well. Um, but whilst people are gathering their thoughts, I, I wonder if I could get the ball rolling perhaps, because I was very struck by how the way that you're approaching this resonates with 
um, you know, the anthropology of colonial appropriation and displacement. There's some very nice work on refugees and how their material culture becomes so essential for precisely uh, the reasons that you've described. But it also, uh, my question really is, is, is to do with how you feel this work, because I can see lots of potential here, um, links with work on notions of personhood and the ways in which personhood is embodied in objects and landscapes and so forth. And in, in very, very different ways, because one of the things that your wonderful lecture draws attention to is the boundedness of territoriality and the ways in which limits ideas about personhood. And now it is actually a very fluid processual thing that extends quite often widely and, and, and in particularly in subcultural groups is very much embedded in local landscapes, etc. Um, but what this really brings home to me is, is, is the notion that, um, that this links beautifully with some of the concepts about material culture and, and personhood and also the way that personhood is extended more broadly into sentient landscapes and uh, uh, landscapes considered to contain ancestors um, and also a potentially lovely link with notions of extended mind, because of course that sort of cognitive approach to the self is, is quite complementary to the notion of extended personhood, which takes us right back to Hegel, really, and the notion of the self being extended into the world and back again. Um, so I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit about the potential to link with that body of theory, which I think could be really interesting in terms of dissolving the fixity of territoriality. Thank you. Uh, Veronica, it's a very interesting point. Then there is a thread within property theory um, that actually uses that Hege Hegelian um, uh, extending myself into, into the objects that then allow me to identify myself, my selfhood. Um, so, uh, so that's been used in some, in some scholarship. And I think it's, it's, it, has, it has potential. Um, uh, but, but I think we also need, I mean, I think what, what, what the, what our, um, respondents are telling us is that we need to situate personhood and, and think about it not in some sort of flat sense but recognize the, the very different stakes that somebody who are, is precariously housed face in terms of the relationships they have to their stuff and by extension their personhood and how they articulate that um, to others. Uh, so, uh, so you know I know stuff material culture it's very fashionable uh, there's also you know if you want to follow that thread there's also uh, you know the sort of uh, literature now minimalism or you know it's very fashionable to think about when decluttering and minimalism and Marie Kondo and all that sort of stuff and putting that in this context it's just so jarring of course because um, you know uh, when you think about what sparks joy uh, and you're living outside I think you have to think differently uh, um, and, and I, I did an interview yesterday actually which really struck resonated with me uh, in which um, uh, a woman <clears throat> told me um, not just about the importance of, of stuff to people who are precariously housed. So if, if you are poor, if you're precariously housed, all you have is your stuff. I think that's a crucial point. But she talked about the way in which her stuff was important for her in, uh, and she used the phrase, it allow, they, they serve as trophies of achievement. That was the phrase she used. In other words, she could, if she has stuff, she can signal to others that she has some stability, that, mm -hmm. that her life is, 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 this is the way I read it, I need to think about it more, but, uh, so it's communicating to others that she has some balance and security in her life, um, uh, um, as as do you know most of us. I hope uh, the, the things we take for granted, those 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 assumptions, she can articulate those to others. So 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 I would want to I think think personhood in this particular space, this particular context, more carefully. Uh, uh, um, uh, so thank you. I think it's a, it's a good observation. Could ask maybe a follow-up question. Uh, that um, what you're really providing is a is a concept of very fluid property relations that are continually shifting and adjusting according to the very specific context that people find their, their, themselves in. And and this seems to be something that's coming through quite strongly in the project as well. That we actually need a much uh, less static vision of, of property to work with and that it is something that you know goes through particular spatial and temporal contexts all all the time and that there's also lots of ways to assert property relations that don't come into the kind of legal thing yeah there is a there is absolutely a temporality i wouldn't say that property is fluid in one sense in that in that it's there's actually a sort of fix of assumed fixity to it right uh, but but the, the sense of being able to turn things off and on I think is a really important uh, important point 
Um, mm. Should I just pick up on one of these questions from Sarah here? Yes, um, I, I don't know if everyone's getting it, so if I may, I'll just um, note that she says it's true that in Abbotsford the bylaws would just come up and cut people's tents and belongings, but wondered if they, if you'd heard from your participants about the kind of regulation of precariously housed people's belongings when they're not necessarily taken away. So, for example, in shelters, staff might say no unpacking because it makes things messy, so everyone's always having to carry around their things, so you can bring your things and, and so forth, but you're always worrying about them and, and having to carry them. Yes, absolutely. If it had more time, I would have been able to unpack that. I mean, what we're trying to recognise is that people are actually moving through multiple spaces. Um, uh, uh, they're not just living outside and moving through that shuffle. There may be the inner shelter or maybe they're in transitional housing or maybe they access housing. So trying to recognize that, that the people are moving through these spaces. And as they move through these spaces, they often encounter different sorts of regulatory control, uh, which is sometimes more or less inclusive. So shelters, yes, will often uh, place limits on how much stuff you can bring in. They'll place limits on whether you can bring in animals, for example, which is also crucial. That's a very important thread. Um, that one of my students, Claire uh, Shapton, is working on. Um, so people will choose not to shoot, go to shelters because they can't take their animals with them, uh, or they go into uh, uh, into uh, private rental housing, and then there are issues there with um, <coughs> with landlords or with with roommates. So, so it's a very good point. Yes, there are multiple sp multiple spaces at work here, and we're actually right now talking to the regulators, uh, as we're calling them, private and public, to try and understand the work that they do and the. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, the approaches that they have. Right, now that's lovely. We've got a question here from S. <laughs> One of the things I've considered is the law's reaction to freeganism. Recently, I've suggested there's a failure on Freegan's part to speak the pros of personality, uh, as in Gray and Gray's rhetoric of reality, and how this impacts in a commercialization of waste, and how does this connect to the inverse situation of precarious property uh, that you're dealing with? Okay. So I'm not sure what freeganism uh, is, to be honest. Um, so I, it would be hard for me to speak to, <laughs> to that directly. I feel like I should know more. Um, um, is freeganism the is freeganism is maybe the idea that that uh, uh, it's a critique of of, of waste and uh, um, is that perhaps uh, is that perhaps the question? So maybe I could ask Sean to clarify that, and we could come back to that so I can respond more intelligently to that. Yeah, all right, we'll park that one for a moment then. And then we've got one from Anna Stagno, uh, which is um, says how interesting your I notion is stuff and the relationship is on more than boundaries and so forth. But that's more of a comment. And then um, I think this is Sean coming back about freeganism, suggesting there's an aspect of the social treatment of waste, and the yes. way that these precarious possessions are deemed to be treated as waste, especially that point about things being um, uh, thrown into the garbage truck. Yes, yes, uh, thank you. So uh, yeah, so clearly there is, so uh, there is a sort of logic of waste, um, which is more than just stuff, obviously, it's a assumption of, of people as engaged in wasteful forms of social activity. And, and uh, um, so, so, so certainly one of the uh, frames that regulators use is around waste, although it's not the only one, interestingly. There are other sorts of frames that also seem to be at play. One is actually around, around uh, sort of what's well, connected to waste, but it's this idea of having excess stuff, uh, which folds over into, into so-called hoarding, which is another very interesting uh, uh, area that one of my other graduate students, Marina Chavez, is, is, is working on. And the idea there is that precariously housed people are assumed to have too much stuff uh, and they don't, they're using that stuff in, in if you like, wasteful ways, I suppose, uh, as, as compared to me and all my stuff, which I use in a very <laughs> efficient uh, and organized way, supposedly. Uh, and because they have too much stuff, they have to get rid of some of that stuff. And we'll help them take some of that, we'll take some of that stuff from them um, so that they can then access shelter and make less wasteful uh, decisions. Um, so that's an interesting, uh, that's a very interesting thread, absolutely. Yeah, um, Sean's now identified himself as coming from uh, York Law School um, and notes that freegans are those who take goods abandoned by others. Um, but that notion that they've been abandoned is, is obviously quite telling, you know, that, they, they're, that they're dispersed, you know, that they can be displaced in, in that kind of way. And then we've got a question from Belen um, wondering about a more communal approach to property and how these connect with a more individual approach, which is obviously the most legally recognised. Um, but this sense of loss is clearly felt, I think it's a nice point, at a communal level, and the rights often muted. So how can be the notion of um, 
be integrated into communal sense of property. Yes, I was thinking about indigenous plants as well. Yes, that's 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 a re that's a really interesting thread um, that I think we need to think about more more carefully. I mean, it's clearly the case that people, um, so people who are say living outside or living in shelters will engage in communal practices where they'll keep an eye on other people's stuff mm. um, and obviously share things uh, 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 as, uh, as well. Um, so, so you do see that. This is why people sometimes choose to, to, to camp outside together so they can, one person can keep an eye on other people, person's stuff while they go and, you know, they work as often people do or, uh, uh, or, you know, have to go to a hospital or something. So, so there are sort of communal practices of, of, uh, of regulation and control that I think bear, bear attention. I saw a comment from Zach earlier, earlier up as well. Maybe we missed that and need to go back to that. Um, oh, yes. Yes, uh, your informants are on the receiving end of the taking and impoverishment with respect to property. So can you take speak a bit more about the work that taking and impoverishing does because they clearly suffer in that process. And then there's a question who benefits, which yes, does follows on from what you've said really. Yes, uh, so I suppose, I think the question there is is, is about uh, those who are actually engaged in taking and, 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 and the experience of, 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 of taking. Um, so we're, as I say, we're really just working just now with the regulators, and so it's it's um, uh, uh, so we have yet to really kind of dig into that material. Um, that people won't talk about taking; they'll 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 talk they'll use other language, right? They'll they'll you know they'll so for example they'll say you know uh, we're we're helping people make good choices, uh, for example, because if you have too much stuff, then obviously you you know you can't make good choices. Um, uh, so, so they'll often use different sorts of um, frames or justifications or rationales, uh, you know, we're sustaining or maintaining public order, um, rather than, um, you know, I'm crushing people's stuff in the back of a truck and I'm relishing that process. So, uh, um, uh, so that's another thread we need to think more, more about. And I, this is preliminary uh, scholarship. So. A preliminary um, material here, um, my, my intervention here. So, so I'd love to. Um, we need this is really helpful. These these uh, these points. Okay, and we've got a question from Jeff Dean about children going into the care system. Oh, yes. that experience, which would be yes. a very fruitful area. We are trying to do work with youth um, uh, because I think they I think they do have very particular experiences. Um, uh, and they can only take so much stuff with them and so on. Um, so so we, we've, we've yet to really do that. It's hard to do research right now, of course, under COVID conditions, but there are constraints on, on, on the sort of face-to-face -face research that we're doing. Um, we do certainly see a thread though uh, about, uh, in which women talk about losing their stuff and losing their kids at the same time, uh, which speaks to the, to the gender dimensions of this. Um, and, and obviously losing your stuff and losing your kids is not the same, but, but they're connected, that sense of, of, of massive devaluation. Uh, uh, and, and then also losing the pictures that you have of your kids um, uh, is also, is also uh, unfortunately a very profound um, and common uh, occurrence. Mm. And we've got a question from Cal Buffery about being a new age traveler and the notion that um, the idea of trespass, does the research touch upon the illegality of non-property owning, you know, the sort of threat of people who aren't made into good citizens by owning property? Ah, oh, okay. Uh, um, uh, trespass clearly is at work here, um, uh, although it's interesting that, you know, as I say, it's, 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 it's used in this, um, um, Often capricious uh, and unpredictable manner. Um, uh, the illegality of non-property owning. Uh, so I think there's a different point here about um, about uh, a certain sort of attitude towards property, um, uh, and we don't. I haven't seen that in the, the the people we've spoke to, and they're they're very very attuned to to to, to property ownership. They're not necessarily you know pro pro uh, forms, sort of alternative forms of property uh, relationship. Um, um, they'll, they'll actually speak about their property rights, <laughs> interestingly, in terms of their stuff. Um, so they're not, you know, engaged in that sort of a logic. Uh, Sarah's point here. 
Yes, yeah, so about people's practice of resistance to the regulation of property, and that comes back to Abbotsford, the dump, dumping of chicken manure in the camp. Yes, this, there's a fame, this is um, this is the chicken manure incident which happened in Abbotsford, um, where where um, city staffers uh, decided to uh, target an encampment. Uh, this is in the area actually around the uh, the rail line. Um, by, by spreading chicken manure on the ground. And chicken manure is highly acrid, it's really unpleasant. And also actually spraying, putting bear spray on the tent. Now bear spray is not something you hear about in Durham, I imagine, but bear spray is quite common in Canada and highly toxic. It's like, you know, uh, CS gas or something. So if you touch it, put it in your eyes, it's, it's, it's uh, but this was chemical warfare. Um, uh, so obviously there are forms of resistance. Um, uh, they're, they're everyday resistance, I think. There's also system, more organized forms of resistance. So the chicken manure incident triggered a, uh, a successful uh, court case. Um, so they take, multiple, they take multiple forms, but mostly um, the sense I get sadly is, is, is attempts at negotiating these systems um, rather than uh, more organized systems but there are so we are working with a group in Abbotsford um, actually that was connected to that project to the to the chicken manure incident uh, who are very interested in in articulating their experience through this project so in that sense it's perhaps a form of resistance. I'm very struck Nick by the, the resonances with colonial uh, hostilities in the appropriation of, of people's land and property you know things like the poisoning of water holes and that sort of thing. Uh, it, 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 it suggests that what we're also talking about here is a kind of intra-class dynamic of hostility towards, towards these groups of people that's actually, you know, quite a layer of, of ideas within society about the sort of lack of control over people who are not suitably located in the picket fence. So this is really yes. interesting stuff coming through. We've got a final question, perhaps, I think, from, from Sean about freeganism and trespass and the idea that the, because people trespass, they're not entitled to pick up things that other people have abandoned. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if they're sort of losing their rights by being being um, being without a place. Yes. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, uh, one interesting thread, which I think takes this slightly differently, is is the experience that um, precariously housed people in Abbotsford described was actually people dropping stuff off, um, dropping off their waste, which perhaps on the assumption that this would be beneficial to people who were living outside, but the people living outside pointed out that this was actually mostly garbage. And so, uh, but the presumption was, you know, by extension, that this is, this is appropriate for them given their, given their status. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to have to make this one the last question from Hannah to, to know if your participants spoke about any support they've received in storing their stuff and how that might change their relationship to, to places and cities. Yes, so storage is, is hugely political. I mean, uh, in the same way that say toilets are to, to, to houseless people. So, so storage uh, and, and uh, controls on storage are, are a huge deal. Um, uh, sometimes, yes, there are. So there are some innovative attempts to create storage spaces that allow people to secure their possessions for periods of time. Um, regulators complain that people don't come back and, and it becomes a mess. Um, uh, what's interesting is the question of who controls that storage is crucial. So in one context, a storage site was created right next to the police station, which is like the last place you want to put <laughs> a storage facility. Um, so that was not highly successful. So um, yeah, it's an important thread. Mm. Oh, although actually, as you say that, it occurs to me about there are some really interesting um, potential imaginative leaps that people could make through their experience of traveling in a precarious way. Because when people travel, they enter this kind of precarity of property and, and what they're always frightened of losing is their passport, their identity. That's and right. of course, they'd be delighted to have a secure place by, by a police station. But it's actually not a dissimilar problem that they suddenly become vulnerable to things, their stuff being taken. Um, so, you know, it may be a way, I think, perhaps to connect more empathetically with what homeless or houseless people experience. Um, final thing from Naomi Keenan, uh, gentrification. She describes a person who's died of AIDS having all their belongings thrown into a skip. Oh yes, indeed, gentrification. And yes, and this does strike me that what we're looking here as well is, is a notion of pollution. 
um, of, of personhood and pollution as well and, and invasion. So yes, that taps very nicely into some of the things we're working on at the IS, but I'm afraid we have run out of time and I'm sure that people could continue this chat for quite a while, but hopefully they will have opportunities to talk to you down the line. And I, I'm sure that the IS will be very delighted to hear more from you. Thank you so much for a really, really wonderful lecture. And I uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, everyone who attended. I'm sure you all enjoyed that. And the conversation will continue. Thank you. I appreciate the questions and comments.